first time, second time, I don't know, maybe maybe you've been here a hundred times and you're wondering, why do people raise their hand when they pray or when they worship? Well, there's been a lot of different examples and analogies that were given. The one I like best comes from hockey. <laughs> if you want to beat your opponent, the first thing you have to do is pull his jersey over his head and lock up his arms. Why? Because it puts him in a defenseless position. When your arms are raised, you're vulnerable. When we come to church and we extend our hands, we're vulnerable. And I can tell you, I can tell you, I, I'm not judging anybody, but I can tell you in a service who wants to be vulnerable and who doesn't based on our willingness to say, okay, God, I give you all whatever you want. If you're battling that today, I want to challenge you. I want us to do something. I want you to just stretch your hands. Nobody's looking. Nobody's judging. But will you just stretch your hands to heaven and say, God, I give you all today. I give you all today. 
all that I am, I give you all. I love you today. I give you all today. I just come to give you glory tonight. I just come to magnify you tonight. I just come to lift you up tonight. I surrender all. I surrender all to you today. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your worship tonight. Man, that's encouraging, isn't it? It's encouraging when we're in the presence of the Lord. I'm thankful that he's meeting us here right now. Amen. He's meeting us here right now. And you may be seated. We've got the last of our First Steps class happening tonight. Our youth will be going to their class, their uh, session tonight, to their youth service. There's a lot of great things happening here on the campus today, and I'm thankful for that. Very, very thankful for that. Um, tonight, when you go home and you say your prayers, maybe before you go to bed, include Florida, because they're going through it right now. And there will be lives that are affected tonight because of that. And so we need to remember that very much. Well, we're going to continue talking about worship, the culture of worship in this church and what it means and how we live it out. We've talked about how worship involves, it, it requires our participation. And then we started talking about how worship is emotional. Now, every year, there is a particular Sunday where every pastor of every church across the whole United States says, well, if you will give it for your team, you should give it for the Lord. And that's Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> where everybody says, you know, if you'll clap and get excited for your team, then you should at least do it for the Lord. And the whole principle behind that concept is that we don't have a problem being emotional. We just struggle with who we want to be, who we, how we want to sacrifice our emotions for. And when it comes to sports teams, especially ones you watch on TV, there's no commitment. The only commitment you may be made is by a jersey, and that's about it. But there's no real commitment. But when you become emotional for God, it is a commitment. And our worship to the Lord is a commitment, and it is emotional because you cannot express love without emotion. And so we were talking about that going into that last Wednesday, the need for emotion in our worship, and it very much so. Now, there's all different ways to worship and different styles, and we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a little bit, but I want to talk about the emotional side of that first before we get into the style worship involves emotions but we do not worship to reach an emotional high you ever heard of runner's high runner's high happens when you get to jogging and you get we often they say well i got into the zone well really what they mean is you got you finally ran enough and you exerted enough energy that your brain and your body is now beginning to release enough endorphins and, enough, and, and that you feel this exhilaration, this high, and so you feel less of the pain and more of the joy in the middle of the run. And that actually is a very real thing and very pleasurable thing. You'll suffer later, but right then you don't feel it, right? You feel like you can conquer the world. Well, let me make sure you understand there's nothing wrong feeling happy during worship or after worship or even there's nothing wrong with the release of endorphins during your worship but if you're chasing the endorphins when you worship then you're not focusing on God you're focusing more on yourself and that's not worship right now what I'm not saying is we shouldn't be excited and we shouldn't be exuberant what I am saying is that we need to make sure that our worship is, is about God. 
So let, let me address a few things here because I, I kind of got into this and alluded to this and I don't want to take the easy way out. I certainly want to, I want to communicate, okay? The decision to worship, the decision to sing, the, the decision to clap your hands, to dance, it always starts in your flesh. Always. It always begins in the flesh. Now, it may be a decision in your mind that you're going to overcome your flesh, but ultimately, every time you begin the process of praise and worship, it begins in your flesh. The first time you clap your hands, it is your flesh clapping your hands. The first time you say amen, it is your flesh saying amen. So you're not caught up in the spirit when you start. So what that means is that worship and praise does involve the flesh. It involves it. But it cannot be controlled and it cannot be focused on the flesh. So let's talk about styles of worship and different kinds of worship. Now, we are a Pentecostal church. And so some people you know, already have a preconceived idea of what that means. And, and I don't judge that. I understand that. Uh, but let's talk about that. Everybody ever heard of a holy roller? A holy roller. Well, I've seen it. I don't think I've ever done it, but I've seen it. I'm not judging that, right? I don't care if you want to roll on the floor as long as it's about God and not about your flesh. Or if you run the aisles. Now, I get it. Sometimes people have to find the way out of their flesh. And so they decide they're going to do something almost extreme in a way to control their flesh. I get that. The way to say, hey, you're not in control of me. Let's put it like that. I get that. And so some people may decide that their best way to do that is to take a lap around the church. I remember early on, we had a young man here, and I was, we were teaching, <laughs> so funny, we were teaching on tithing, and he got happy in the Lord, I guess, because he decided he was going to take a lap around the church. And the only thing I could remember really about it was that his jogging pants were kind of loose, and I was so worried. I was just praying, Lord, please don't let his pants fall. Please don't let his pants fall. And I just told the church, it's okay. He's just happy about tithing, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. But I'm not saying there's anything wrong with taking a lap around the church. Nothing wrong with that as long as it's not in your flesh. As long as you're not doing it to be seen. As long as what you're doing is unto the Lord. If it's not with God in focus... Now, granted, we got young people, and, and they're, they do a great job. They lead in a lot of our worship. You'd be proud of them at HYC and the different conventions they go to. You'd be so proud of them. And we encourage them to worship with all their heart, right, all their soul, all their, all their might and all their mind, depending on which verse you're reading. We, we encourage them to, to, to love God that way and to worship God that way. But just because somebody else is doing it doesn't mean you should do it if you're not doing it for the right reasons. Now, positive peer pressure is a good thing, but it needs to be for the Lord. So if you're, if, if you're taking a lap around the church and the whole time you're looking to see who's looking at you, now, first of all, you're going to hurt yourself, right? And second of all, it's not, it's not of the Lord. Now, I have seen some great things happen in worship services. I have seen people break legs just because of excitement. I'm not judging that. I'm not saying it was wrong. I'm just saying that we need to make sure it's of the Lord. We need to make sure that God is the focus. I've seen people in church services who have, they, they fight this desire. They know they need to magnify God. But they're fighting this desire in them. Maybe it's, maybe it's, it's a, an internal struggle. But when they finally get to the place where they're going to let go, they also seem to, let, they seem to get the jerks. I'm not judging that as being wrong. 
I can't say whether it's right or wrong. I can't say how somebody worships God is right or wrong as long as it's in order. All right? Now, Paul talks about that. Everything has to be done in decency and order. You know, there was a, a, a video on YouTube. YouTube has videos of everything. But it was, it was a church service some years ago, and a guy prayed for a gentleman, and the gentleman got excited. I'm sure you've all seen it. The gentleman got excited, and he runs up on the, on the stage and jumps and stands on the platform, on the pulpit. Then he jumps off of that, and he runs to the back, and he jumps in the back. Of, I don't know. It wasn't a baptistry. It wasn't wet, but I think he hurt himself. And the thing is, that's not in order. Now, is he sincere? I'm sure. I'm not questioning his sincerity. I'm not questioning his relationship with God. But at the same time, it needs to be in order. I'll give you another example where it's out of order. If somebody decides they want to run a lap while the pastor's preaching or the preacher's preaching and he's talking and the whole time they're running back and forth in front and nobody else can receive the word, that's out of order. Right? There's... there's it doesn't mean they're not sincere. So we're not judging somebody on sincerity or on their relationship with God. There's no judgment there. But yet we order ourselves, our worship, according to what is in decency and order, according to the Word of God. And we honor the Word while it's being preached. So my buddy is a great guy, and I love him so very much, but he's always struggled with, with this internal side where he... Where when he finally says, okay, I give all, his response is literally a, 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 lack, a, a loss of control physically with his limbs and, and very emotional and very physical. And I'm not judging him on that. But let me ask you, which is better? To have a moment like that where you've been, you've been storing it up for so long and you've been battling your flesh for so long, it comes out in an uncontrolled environment. Or every Sunday you come to church and you magnify God with pure, honest worship and praise and glory. Which one is going to lead you to a better relationship with Jesus Christ? So we're not judging that. But we got to make sure that what we do, not only is it in order, but, but it needs to be pleasing to God and it needs to be to God. Now you might say, well, you know, that's sacrilegious. We're Pentecostal. We just worship God however. We, you know, we have some really neat stories. We really do. Um, but the scripture also talks about strange fire. When, when the tabernacle was, was created, God said, this is where you're, I'm going to give you this fire. This fire is what you're going to light the, the incense with. This fire is what you're going to light the, 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 the uh, altar here with. And you're going to put it in your incense with. And if you put any other kind of fire in there, any other fire that you create on your own, if you let the candlestick go out and you let everything go out and you try to create your own fire, then you have strange fire. It's a type of our worship. If it's, not, if it's not committed to Him, but it's what we do on our own in order to please our flesh or to be recognized by somebody else, then that's not pleasing to God. So we are emotional. We're emotional. And here at New Life, somebody may show emotion by just clapping their hands, but staying in their seat. They may shake a little bit and get excited a little bit. They may cry a little bit. Somebody may run the aisles a little bit. They may, uh, um, I haven't seen it yet. You might have somebody, George, you might roll on the floor today before we're done. <laughs> I'm okay with that. That doesn't bother me, as long as it's for the Lord. If it's not for the Lord, then, then that, that's the problem, Right? So we want to make sure that what we do is in decency and in order and is for the Lord. Now, I could go down the line about a bunch of other things, but it, you know, I, I think that's, that's the key there. Our emo we are an emotional people. We worship God with our emotions. 
but our emotions have to be submitted to him. So let's talk about style since we're there. Worship is not just any single style, right? I've seen people worship God without music. Been in church services where we had no music. I've seen, uh, I grew up in a church that had a more uh, of a little bit of a country style of worship. Um, I've literally seen a guy play, I am a friend of God on a banjo. And that was interesting, right? So I've seen that. Um, some churches have large choirs. I've been a part of those. Uh, not singing, just part of the church, <laughs> so everybody knows. Um, <laughs> amen. I've seen some that have worship leaders that scream. I've seen some that don't. Uh, I've seen some that have calm style of worship. It's all worship. We need, we need to understand that. It's all worship. And it's not our place to judge that. It's our place to be a part of that. Now here at New Life, our style, at least the style of music, is more contemporary. And there's a reason for that. It's that so that people who come to New Life for the first time may recognize songs that maybe they've been singing in their car driving down the road. And it's an easier step to worship than to get a song you don't know. And we put the words on the screen. Thank God we do that because there are songs we sing that I don't know because I don't listen to K-Love. I don't even listen to music, but I don't listen to K-Love. And so I don't know some of the songs. I get them here at church. And so that, you know, it's okay. It's just that's why we choose the style we choose. It's not just because we don't like other styles. I'm sure there's people that don't. I like other styles. I grew up other styles. I still got a songbook hidden around this place so nobody will steal it. Okay? I'm not saying I'm breaking it out. I just said I got one hidden, all right? So I like other styles, but that's the style we choose. Uh, church on Sundays here at New Life, it is about guests. I want you to get that because I, I, I'm... There's a reason why I'm trying to teach culture. Because God is doing something in this church that I have prayed about and I've sought God for and I didn't understand how. And I see it now. Not because I see it, but because God has revealed how. And the key is going to be sure that we have the right culture. That culture means that Sundays... Church is about those that walk in here that are guests that are looking for an experience with God. Well, they're not the one that pays the bills. I know. That's why we have church on Wednesday. It's for you. And guess what? Sunday, you can enjoy God too, right? Well, you know, that's, um, that, you just don't understand. You got to make church about everybody. See, there's the problem. Can I be honest real quick? Uh, I, I don't know why I say that. I'm going to be honest no matter what. I just want your attention when I say this. That's why I said that. The reason we are stuck where we are number-wise is because we're worried about what's for me. Instead of worrying about what's for the guest. Well, this isn't just about, you know, people got to be saved. People got to be, you know, we still got to take care of the, the, the church members. We do. We got to shepherd and we got to love the church members. We got to love the body of Christ that we're given. But you know what? He gave us a lot of instructions to get there. And a lot of those instructions involve us spending time together. They involve us encouraging and uplifting one another. It involves us sharing the gospel with one another and, and being there for one another. And we want just the pastor and a couple song leaders to entertain us enough and make us feel good enough so that we can get by till next week. Tell me, that is not the design that God created for the church. And until we get out of that design and get into the design where we are sharing the gospel, Jesus Christ 
literally told the disciples, I'm going to give you power because I want you to take it out there and share it. And when the church didn't share it, God brought uh, um, persecution on Jerusalem so that it would break up the church and it would spread out. But we're entertain- we like the entertainment that we get. And I'm not trying to be mean. I, I, I'm just, I really feel like God's doing something. And the culture has to be here. It has to be according to what God wants to do. And if it's not here, the way God wants it to be here, then we'll stay, we'll stay the way we are and we'll be happy and sing kumbaya together. I once went to a church. I shouldn't tell this. I once went to a church and it was a Wednesday night and I was passing through. I was, we were heading to do something, had to meet with somebody, blah, blah, blah. Ended up at this church. And when I got there, they were all reading your eulogies of what they would want their eulogy to be. It was on a Wednesday night. I know. I'm thinking, this, sound, this feels like a dead church. Literally, right? Why would we do things that we're okay with but, have, but, but really about us? but we don't make it so that people can come to Christ. we got to make sure we have the right right culture. And that's why Sundays are dedicated to our guests. Wednesday nights, now that's about development. That's about body growth. That's about uh, strengthening and encouraging one another. That's why, you know, we we have the meals. Now, they're, they're fundraisers. Uh, meals, but man, those are great times for fellowship. That's find somebody you don't talk to all the time. You sit down, you look at them, you talk to them, and you know what? When you do that, you grow the church. Well, I don't have anything in common with them. Well, that's the whole point, right? Sit down and talk to them. And you think, well, what's that have to do with worship? Well, that's exactly what worship is. It's about encouraging and edifying and strengthening one another. But that's not the way we see it. You know what? Let me handle this too while I'm at it. <laughs> I think I had too much coffee today. I, you don't have to come here to eat. All right? If, there's a, if there is a, a fundraiser, don't, you don't have to come to eat. But why don't you go ahead, eat at home, eat after church, I don't care, eat at home, and then come anyways to spend time with people. Just a thought. I want to say more, but I really want to be nice. So I'm going to move on. All right. Sundays are about those looking for God. So whatever style we choose, whatever style you choose, whatever style the church is, it's not about entertainment. So let me make sure you understand this. Lights. Chandler back there. Smoke, (laughs) haze, sorry, haze, music style, attire that is worn by those that are leading, those cannot be about entertainment. Well, you know, I mean, lights are nightclub-ish. Well, I get it, but you guess what? I mean, if you can use a tambourine to worship God, you can use a light somehow to worship God. It's not, <laughs> I'm finally getting to say everything I wanted to say for like 50 years here, you know. Um, it's not, inter- so we don't do it for entertainment, we do it for worship. Brother Kilgore used to tell the story about a, uh, a, a meeting, a church conference, a church meeting that was going on, and there was a young man who, man, he looked the part, he had it together. And his job was to, he was going to get up and sing. So there was a couple different singers, and he was going to get up and sing. And he, he looked good. And so he gets up there, his chance, he gets up there, and he sings. And, man, it just comes out. He is a singer. And he hit every note right. He hit it perfect. 
he hit. I mean, and you know, there, you know how it is. There's certain octaves where people get excited, right? And there's certain, there are certain lengths that you hold a, a note, and everybody's like, oh, "Whoa, that's Jesus! I feel him!" You know, that type of thing. And you're like, "Wow, this is awesome!" And, and and so he's up there, he's doing all of this, and and he's hitting everything right because he's Pentecostally trained, right? And at the end of it, he gets done, and people clap their hand, and he walks off the stage. And then the next guy gets up, and he's, he's just a, an old country boy. And he gets up there, and he begins to sing. He's just singing it, just an old song. But he's singing it unto the Lord. And as he does, the whole congregation begins to be moved. And the Spirit of God begins to fall. And the house just breaks out into worship. And at the end of it, the young man looks over to the, his mentors that are sitting, standing there beside him. He said, what, what's the difference? And they looked at him and said, you did it to entertain them. He did it to worship God. There's a difference. It doesn't matter the style. It matters the heart of the person that is doing it. Is it unto God or is it entertainment? So style is a part of our worship. I'll give you something else as a part of our worship here at New Life that's maybe a little different than some churches, and that is where we are a learning, teaching, or teaching slash learning church. We have new people who will get up here and sing Who's never, you know, they will have some had some opportunities before to sing, but they will Wednesday nights especially, they'll get up and they'll lead, and it will be, I believe, be their first time. And you know what? They'll probably not do the best they've ever done or the best they'll ever do. But they'll get up here and mistakes and all, as a church, we'll work with them through it and we'll still worship God. Because the worship may, may be promoted and led from here, but it can also be led from there. It doesn't take the perfect song. It doesn't take the perfect piano player. It doesn't take the perfect singer in order for there to be a move of God it does not take the perfect note. It doesn't. They can mess up, and this church will still worship God. Why? Because it's who we are. It's not an entertainment package that we purchased. It is who we are. When we walk in this house, we come to magnify the Lord. That's what we do. And your worship. And my worship, and the reason why that matters so much is that our worship does not just affect us. If you sit there on your hands because you had a bad day and everything was rough, so you just don't feel like magnifying God, if you sit there on your hands, you will impact somebody else around you. You will. Now, they may overcome it, but you're still impacting them. Because your worship does help determine how others worship. If you have free worship, the person next to you who may be getting a divorce will have free worship. And I want you to get that. You don't know what they're going through. You might have got yelled at on the job. You might even have lost your job and it feels like the world has come to an end. But they actually are losing their marriage. And here you are worried because you had a bad day and you're not going to magnify God. And they're just looking for somebody to set a tone for a little bit of liberty so that they can freely raise their hands without having to think about everything they're going to go home to. And you don't know what all they're going home to. You don't know. They may be going home to an abusive situation. And church may be the only place they get freedom. And you're worried that that that, that the bills aren't getting paid because you know what? You spent a little too much money last week on vacation and the whole time this person's saying, I just need a place to be able to be in the presence of God. If you don't worship, if I don't worship, it's most likely that those near us will struggle to worship. 
Because the one thing I have learned is that very few people like to hear themselves sing. And nobody likes to hear me sing. <laughs> a church that doesn't worship will never be attractive. First to God and second to others who are looking to be in the presence of God. So we all worship. Including those who are not perfect. So let me make sure you understand this. Worship is for everybody. Worship is for anyone. So when somebody walks in this house and you know their past and you've known what they do, you know who they are, maybe you've seen, you've seen something in the paper, maybe you know a story. If they walk in this place and the presence of God is moving and they just begin to magnify God and you judge them as a hypocrite, you don't understand what worship's about. Worship is not an indicator of, hip of hypocrisy. Worship is for everyone. Worship, you do not have to be perfect. You do not have to be, you do not have to have it all together. You can have a lot of mistakes and walk in this house and raise a hand because you want God to know that you know who you are and you don't like who you are and a tear can roll down your face and, or you can clap your hands and still not have your life all together and you can make a lot of mistakes and I'm not saying that you are free of every, every failure you've ever done just because you raise a hand but I am telling you worship is not for those who are just perfect it's for everybody because God is good whether you're good or not God is good and he deserves the praise and the worship no matter what. So it is not my place to judge somebody that walks in here and is in the presence of God and makes their way to an altar when I knew what went on in their life a week ago or a month ago. It's not my place. Why? Because worship doesn't indicate whether you're perfect. Worship indicates whether you realize how perfect he is. That's why we worship. That's the culture in this church. And if we ever break culture, then we become something completely different than what God wants us to be. I need to move on. A couple more aspects of culture here at this church. Worship in this church is spiritual. The Spirit of God moves in our church services here at New Life. I want you to understand that. It's so important to understand. Worship starts in the flesh, but God is attracted to the praises of his people. And it is, a, it is meant to be and lead into a spiritual experience. That means worship and a church service like we have here on a Sunday will involve and yield miracles, signs, and wonders. I want you to get that. It is literally in the DNA of the church. Jesus said in Mark 16 and 17, and these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. Now, look, we, we're already right there talking about things that should happen in a church. So maybe if we haven't had demon casting out, maybe we're, maybe we're not trusted with that yet. I'll move on. This sign will follow those that believe. Now, it's not that you seek after this, but it's going to be the sign that follows those that believe. They will cast out devils. They'll speak with new tongues. Verse 18, you, and I'm going to talk about this in just a second. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means harm them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. That is church. That's church. 
Now, we don't seek after signs. We're not a generation that is seeking after signs. And that's a problem we have, is we think that that kind of sign is entertainment. And so we'll chase church service and preachers and evangelists seeking signs, wanting to be entertained, when we have it right here in this church, because it's the DNA and it's the signs that follow the believers. And if it's not in the church, then maybe the church doesn't have believers. But it is a part of our DNA as a Christian. Now let's handle the, the part of the verse there because some of you are saying, really, i got to pick up snakes? No, you're not picking up snakes. I tell that story and it's, it's so funny. It's funny to me every time I tell it. But you know, I was here in the, in, in the uh, uh, fellowship hall working and uh, I raised a ceiling tile and I was up on the ladder and, and the wall moved. <laughs> It moved because it was a black rat snake. <laughs> it was not going to hurt me. I hurt myself coming off the ladder, but it wasn't going to hurt me. But I knew that I was going to have to tell that story because it's too funny. And once it got out and the church didn't, and, and people thought, well, he didn't do anything in order to try to uh, deal with that, then I would be in trouble. So I called an exterminator, not a taxidermist, an exterminator. Two different things, you know. Called the exterminator that handles snakes. The lady answered the phone. I said, now, my name's Glenn. I pastor a Pentecostal church. It's not one of ours. I need you to come get it. She, it took her a minute, but she got to laughing. I thought it was the funniest thing ever. Oh, a little levity in the moment because my back was hurting anyway. So, um, It's gone. Oh, it was gone that day. I don't know if there's others, but that one's gone. Just for like, I know, I'm joking. But the point is, let's go back to this verse where it says, you shall, uh, you, you know, you will take up serpents, and if you drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. Let me make sure you understand that. Matthew 4 and 7, Jesus said to Satan himself, it's written, you should not tempt the Lord your God. All right? Mark, Jesus does not contradict himself. So when he speaks in Mark, he's not saying that you should tempt God by picking up a serpent because that's literally what people who dance with snakes in worship do is they're trying to prove their faith, right? What that's doing is, although I do believe some of them are very sincere, that is really tempting God, not proving your faith. But you have to take what's said in Mark into consideration and also read Luke, Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now, serpents and scorpions were a real issue in that land, it was a real issue, and it would attack you. It would attack you at your feet, at your ankles, and you would have to trample on them. Notice, though, that Jesus connects trampling on serpents and scorpions with having power over the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Okay, There's a connection there. Jesus does not say, hey, I'm going to allow you to put snakes in your pockets and carry them with you, and oh, by the way, you can destroy all your enemies. He connects them directly, trampling them directly with overcoming your enemies. Um, in essence, what he's saying in Luke, we also can connect back to Mark, and that is if we enter dangerous territory for the gospel's sake, believing and claiming that God's protection is on us, that the enemy can do nothing to hurt us. And ultimately, God will keep us. Our faith can be then, because of our faith, your faith allows the DNA of our Christian walk to be manifested in our life. That's what he's saying. So he's saying, listen, if you're, you're going to be presented with difficult circumstances, difficult situations, you're going to go into places that are unsafe, uh, but if you do it for the gospel's sake, that's what he's saying in Luke. If you do it for the gospel's sake, he's going to keep you 
in that process because of your faith and it's going to be manifested in your life. Likewise, that's exactly how it works when he says you pick up serpents, they're not going to harm you, you're not going to drink any deadly thing, it's not going to uh, hurt you. If you say that picking up snakes is your way of showing your faith, then you might as well just drink Drano, right? I mean, you can't pick part of that and not the other part of that. So we have to understand that's not what that's not what he's saying there. He's not talking about picking up a snake and dancing around in order to show your faith. What he's talking about is that there are going to be times where things, while you are living as a Christian and you're doing the, the will of God, that there are going to be things that might attack you, which could be a snake or it could be something else, but it's going to attack you and God is going to keep you. In that process, remember, this time was very important because drinking deadly things was very common. You could drink water from a, a stream and it would kill you because of the bacteria. That's why they drank a lot of fermented drink, or not like fermented, like extremely alcohol, but you would take wine and put it in a wine uh, bottle or a, a wine pouch, and the tad bit, okay, I want to make sure you understand this, of the beginning process of the formation process, the beginning part of the formation process, would then purify it and they would have a safe drink, better than if they were just drinking water. That's why he tells, Paul tells Timothy, a little wine for your stomach's sake is a good thing. He's not saying, go get drunk, it's going to make your day better. What he's saying is that if you keep drinking water or you keep doing other things, some of that stuff can hurt your body Sometimes there is this natural thing that comes with the vine that will help you. He, he's not saying that they were walking around with drunk packages and bottles of Jack Daniels strapped to them, okay? What he is saying is you need to care for yourself and here's a solution. That's what he's talking about in Mark. Paul literally reached into the fire, and a viper bit him, and he shook it off, and it fell into the fire. And that was the very proof of what Jesus was talking about, not tempting God. Not tempting God. Stand with me, if you will. I'm going to read one more thing, and I'm not going to get into this because we'll get into it more on a different day. But since I'm talking about worship, I'm going to read it. It's a little bit lengthy. It's not too bad. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Can you put that on there? I didn't give you that. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols. <laughs> I like Paul. However, however you were led. Verse 4. He says, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. Verse 7, here we go. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So now we've got the manifestation of the Spirit is given not to the pastor, but to each one to profit all. For, verse 8, For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, by the same Spirit to another the gift of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another dif different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, but one in the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. I'm going to end this, this talking about culture of worship with this. The gifts of the spirit are a part of worship. They're a part of the church. They were not just for then. They are for now. You are to operate in the gifts. I want to say that again. You, look at your neighbor, say you. 
you are to operate in the gifts. It's the church. It's supposed to be done in decency and order. Paul handles that. There will be more training and talk on that. But you are supposed to operate in the gifts. It is the culture of this church. Let's pray. Lord, you're a good God, and I am thankful that you allowed us to be in your presence today. Lord, we're talking about what church is and what, what our church meetings are to be, what worship is supposed to be. And God, there's, there's things we haven't even got to yet, I know, but I'm just asking that your hand would be on us because I don't want to do this for myself. I don't want to do this in a way that just pleases me. I don't want to do this for show. I don't want to have church, Lord, just to try to be, get a crowd. I want to see lives changed, not by what I say, but by your spirit. I want to see you move into lives and change lives because that's really what matters, God. And so I'm asking you to give us wisdom so that we could adhere to your word and adhere to the very culture that we've been talking about and let your gifts operate in the body. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let somebody know you love them. We're going to be back here Sunday, 9 and 11. It's going to be exciting. Lord bless you.